24-year-old Rita Coran was brutally murdered in her own apartment in Burlington, Vermont on 19th July, 1971. The killer left no clues, no fingerprints, and vanished into thin air. At the time, with forensic and DNA science being not as advanced as it is today, there was not much the police could do. For 52 years, the case lay cold and left investigators scratching their heads as they tried to comprehend what had happened. Who killed Rita Coran? How did the police solve the case? Welcome to Cold Case Files, where we shed light on mysterious cases from across the country. Today, we are looking at the 52-year-old cold case of Rita Coran that was finally solved in 2019. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please consider hitting the subscribe and like buttons. Let's dive deep into this mystery without further ado. Today's story takes us to Burlington, a city in the state of Vermont in the United States. It possesses a captivating mix of history, culture, and natural beauty. It's located on the eastern shore of Lake Champlain. The city boasts stunning views of the lake and surrounding mountains. Burlington's fascinating history dates back to its founding in 1785, and its vibrant economy is driven by technology, education, healthcare, and tourism. But this mesmerizing city bore witness to a terrible crime that took place on 20th July 1971 and remained unsolved for the next 52 years. On 21st June 1947, Mary Eleanor Donahue Coran and Thomas F. Coran of New York City held their precious daughter for the first time and named her Rita Coran. Rita was the first child that the Coran family had welcomed. As time passed, they had two more children and Rita got to welcome her two younger siblings. She was blessed with a loving and caring younger brother, Thomas Coran Jr., as well as a beautiful and kind younger sister, Mary Coran. The Coran family was well-known and well-liked in the area they resided, especially since her father Thomas was the zoning administrator for the community. Growing up, Rita was always a quiet and sweet presence, with a shy demeanor that belied her deep reserves of kindness and intelligence. She excelled academically and completed her graduation from Trinity College. She was always passionate about teaching. She completed her degree in primary education and took graduate courses at the University of Vermont. Rita lived with her family for 24 years until one day she decided to move out. It was the first time she had lived away from them and she moved into an apartment on 17 Brooks Avenue in Burlington, Vermont with three other roommates. She fulfilled her dream when she became a beloved second grade teacher in Milton Elementary School. All her students loved her and she made a lasting impact on their lives. One of her students, Jim Robar, still remembers her five decades later for an act of kindness she showed him when he was in the second grade. While acting in a school play, he used a teddy bear as a prop, which he liked a lot, and after the play he asked Rita if he could keep it and Rita allowed him to do so. Rita was also a talented singer and dancer, as she would often spend her time with her younger sister Mary, tap dancing and singing together. During the summer, Rita worked part-time as a chambermaid at the South Burlington Colonial Motor Inn, where she was known for her hard-working and diligent nature. She was loved by her co-workers and guests alike, who were touched by her warmth and sincerity. Can you imagine any reason for such a quiet, kind and warm-hearted person to be killed so brutally. What could have been the reason behind her murder? On July 20th, 1971, when Beverly, one of the roommates of Rita, came back home, she had no idea that a horrifying scene was waiting for her. Beverly Lamphere returned back late from a date with her boyfriend at 1 a.m. The two other roommates were not staying at the house that night, so it was just her and Rita. As she opened the door, she was immediately hit with the scent of iron, the unmistakable smell of blood. Her eyes adjusted to the darkness, and she saw a figure lying on the ground. As she got closer, she realized it was Rita lying partially nude, with blood all over her body. 
Her hair was still in curlers and it looked like she had been preparing for bed when the attack happened. Beverly screamed out for her boyfriend, hoping he could somehow save her friend, but it was already too late. Rita was gone, her life snuffed out in a brutal and senseless act of violence. Beverly's mind raced with questions. Who could do such a thing? Why would someone hurt her dear friend? She immediately called the police as she was very scared and disheartened seeing her friend's demise. The darkness of the night was not comforting, and her mind was racing with thoughts about Rita. She had left her dear friend and roommate just a few hours ago, and Rita had been happy and excited to have the apartment all to herself. The silence of the night was deafening as Beverly and her boyfriend waited for the police to arrive. They couldn't understand why no one had heard anything, no screams, no sound of a struggle. It was like the killer had disappeared into thin air. After a short while, the police arrived at the scene and began the investigation. At first, investigators thought that Rita may have been murdered for money, but Rita's purse containing about $20 was found untouched, so it became clear that a robbery was not the motive. When investigators started to examine the whole apartment, they saw there were bloodstains in the kitchen, which indicated that the murderer could possibly have fled from there. After a thorough examination of the crime scene, the body was sent for an autopsy. The brutality of the attack was evident from the moment the chief medical examiner, Lawrence Harris, laid eyes on Rita's lifeless body. Her body was examined carefully, and they found violent bruises that covered her face and head. It was clear that she had fought for her life with everything she had, leaving behind signs of a fierce struggle. But in the end, it was the crushing grip of the killer's hands around her neck that had silenced her forever. As if the physical violence wasn't enough, the killer tried to kill her in the most brutal way possible. Her torn clothes were found discarded under her body, a cruel reminder of the heinous act that had taken place. The details of the assault were too gruesome to imagine, and it was a small comfort that she had not been sexually assaulted. Investigators swarmed the area around 17 Brooks Avenue, searching for any clues that could help solve the brutal murder of beloved teacher and chambermaid Rita Curran. The air was heavy with the weight of the unsolved crime, and residents of the town were on edge, fearful that the killer might still be lurking among them. Investigators went door to door. They also talked and interrogated the people around 17 Brooks Avenue to see if anyone might have seen or heard something out of the ordinary in the hours leading up to the discovery of Rita's body. They urged residents to think back to that fateful night and to come forward with any information that could help bring justice to the Koran family. The investigators combed through hundreds of leads, pursued every potential angle, and examined every piece of evidence they could find. Despite their best efforts, they hit a dead end. They found a single cigarette butt near Rita's lifeless arm, and they hoped it might provide some kind of a clue to her killer's identity. But at the time, DNA technology was not advanced enough to extract a profile, and the cigarette butt yielded no useful information. The killer remained a mystery, hidden in the shadows, leaving the investigators and the community puzzled. Until, one day, in 1979, FBI agent John Bassett made a chilling connection. The motel where Coran worked was right next to the infamous Elizabeth Lund home for unwed mothers, the birthplace of none other than notorious serial killer Ted Bundy. As Bassett delved deeper into the case, he noticed uncanny similarities between the crime scene and those of Bundy's known victims. Bundy's modus operandi involved stalking the victims for days or weeks before assaulting them. He broke into his victims' apartments and cased their homes, learning their routines and which doors were unlocked. Rita's sister believed Ted Bundy was responsible for her sister's murder and cited some similarities to his other victims. She emphasized that all of Bundy's victims had long brown hair parted in the middle, which she believed was his motive for revenge against his ex-girlfriend. However, Bundy later stated that his victims were chosen for their youth and attractiveness and not for specific hair color or style. 
but after looking into the possible similarities, police found that there were details in this case that did not match Bundy's profile. Burlington Police Chief Kevin Scully stated that Bundy would attack his victims when they were asleep, strangle them with a ligature, and use a weapon to bludgeon them. However, Rita was awake and fought back and was strangled manually with fists. Bundy's crimes were usually planned and involved the use of a weapon in ligature, but Rita's murder seemed impulsive and only involved the use of hands and fists. Before Bundy's execution on January 24, 1989, he denied committing any murders in Vermont, and the Burlington police stated that they had investigated the possibility of his involvement in the Rita Coran case and concluded that Bundy was elsewhere in the country at the time. Now they were left with no other clues that could lead them to the real killer of Rita, and again, the case slowly went cold. For decades, the case of Rita Coran's brutal murder remained a mystery to investigators. But in 2014, a tiny, seemingly insignificant piece of evidence became the key that would unlock the case. It was the cigarette butt, carelessly discarded near the victim's body that had lain forgotten for years. Detectives knew that it was a long shot, but they were able to extract a DNA profile from the cigarette butt and submit it to the National Criminal Database. But unfortunately, no matches were found. It was a puzzling and frustrating dead end. But Detective Lieutenant James Treeb refused to give up. He knew that this DNA profile could be the key to unlocking the case, but he needed to think outside the box. He realized that the person who left that cigarette butt may have never had genetic material entered into the database, possibly because they had never been convicted of a felony. Detective Lieutenant James Treeb refused to let the case of Rita Coran's murder go unsolved. In 2019, he made a bold move and gathered a team of experts to review the evidence, taking a fresh approach to the decades-old case. They combed through every piece of evidence with a fine-tooth comb, determined to find the missing puzzle piece that would crack the case wide open. Treeb knew that they needed a new strategy, and they found it in genetic genealogy. They decided to use this cutting-edge technique to analyze the DNA profile found on the cigarette butt discovered at the scene of the crime. They delved deep into DNA databases, hoping to find a match for the genetic material that had eluded them for so long. Their hard work paid off when an outside expert in genetic genealogy was able to connect the DNA to relatives of a man named William DeRusse. The relative they then contacted was the half-brother of Darus, who was willing to give them his DNA sample, and his DNA helped to finally conclude with certainty that Darus was the one who left behind the cigarette butt found at the scene of the crime. When police looked into Darus's whereabouts at the time of the murder, they found he was living two floors above Rita's apartment at 17 Brooks Avenue. With this breakthrough, they finally had the key to unlock the mystery of Rita Coran's murder. The investigation proceeded, and investigators now found additional DNA evidence on Coran's ripped housecoat that matched the DNA on the cigarette butt found near her body. This discovery strengthened the case against Darus as it linked him to the crime scene in a more concrete manner. They then looked into his past and found out that William DeRusse was married to Michelle in the summer of 1971 in Burlington, just about two weeks before the murder. They were newlyweds who were living in the same building, just two floors above Rita Coran, when she was brutally murdered in 1971. Furthermore, investigators were able to re-interview DeRusse's then-wife, who had previously lied about his alibi when they had interviewed her during the initial investigation, and she admitted to her falsehood. She told them that she had been threatened by DeRusse to say that they were together on the night of the murder, but the truth was that they had had an argument, and DeRusse went outside for a walk to try and cool down. She had no idea about what happened when DeRusse was gone. Her admission was a key factor in the investigation, as it helped to establish Darus's guilt beyond any reasonable doubt. She also told them that shortly after the crime, Darus had left her and moved to Thailand to become a monk. Three years later, he resurfaced in San Francisco, where he met his second wife, Sarah Hepting. Detectives contacted Sarah, his second wife as well, and asked her about Darus. Sarah's account of Darus was chilling. 
She told Burlington police that he once stabbed a woman right in front of her, but luckily she survived the attack. In addition, she revealed that he had tried to strangle her in the same manner that Koran was killed. All of this, along with evidence found against him in the confession of his first wife, was enough for the police to be sure that they had their culprit. But sadly, despite the victory in solving the case, the day was bittersweet for the police, as when they looked into Derus, they learned that he had already died of a drug overdose in 1986. The news of the breakthrough in Rita Coran's murder case sent shockwaves through the community, bringing a mix of emotions for those who knew her and those who had only heard of her through stories. For Mary Campbell, Coran's sister, the case had haunted her family for generations. We now have two generations in our family who never knew her, she said with a heavy heart. But through the tears and the pain, there was a glimmer of hope. Thomas Coran, Rita's brother, found solace in the support of his loved ones. I pray to my parents and I pray to Rita. My wife Nancy tells me we will get through this. We are Coran strong, he said, and his voice was filled with determination. As news of the arrest spread, messages of praise and gratitude poured in from all corners. Former Burlington Police Chief Brandon Del Pozo, who had worked on the case, expressed his admiration for the hard-working detectives who never gave up. This is one of those cases where I regretted that I couldn't find the killer. But I'm so proud of the Burlington Police Department, he said, and his voice was filled with pride. Jim Robar, the former student of Koran's, spoke as well, saying, She was beautiful from the inside out. She told me that I could keep the teddy bear, and I still have the teddy bear. I just can't find it, he said with a heavy heart. Robar's sentiment was echoed by many in the community who remembered Koran as a dedicated teacher who had a passion for education and helping others learn. Her legacy will continue to live on in the hearts and minds of those who knew her and those who only know her through the stories that have been passed down through generations. We hope you've enjoyed this gripping story of how this cold case was solved after more than 50 years. The tireless efforts of investigators and the advancements in forensic technology have allowed this case to finally be solved, bringing closure to the loved ones of the victim. Now we want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this case? Were you impressed by the way it was finally solved? Share your opinions in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.